everyone and welcome along to the ED Extra stage at ED24, the UK's biggest annual corporate climate action experience. ED Extra is a new channel that we have set up to bring our audience closer to the individuals, teams, organisations and projects that are driving corporate climate and environmental action in the UK and further afield. At ED24, we're launching the channel with numerous quick-fire discussions taking place in this dedicated stage, um, with you, our live audience, tuning in to hear thought-provoking discussions all in the time it takes you to have a cup of coffee. For this session, we're focusing on net zero policy making in the UK and beyond. Um, we're looking at whether recent green policy rollbacks in the UK have impacted sustainable business and what the upcoming general election means in terms of opportunities and challenges for policy making in the green economy. I'm ED's content editor, Sarah George, and joining me for this discussion, we have James Fotherby, Senior Policy Officer at the Aldersgate Group. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Um, I think it probably bears starting with a quick introduction to the Aldersgate Group for listeners and audience members who, who haven't had the pleasure. Of course, yes, yeah, so it's really good to be here. Um, as Sarah said, my name is James. And the Aldersgate Group is an alliance of cross-sector businesses, including some of the largest in the UK, uh, professional bodies, academic institutions and civil society organisations. And together, through our collective voice, we drive for a competitive and sustainable economy. Great. Um, so I think I'll just go straight in with it. It's a tumultuous time for green policy making um, in the UK. We ended last year in the last quarter with the incumbent Prime Minister rolling back policies on electric vehicles, home heating and home energy efficiency. And then as we began this new year, um, Labour confirmed that it would roll back its 28 billion a year green industrial pledge. So from your members and from the wider business space, what has the reaction to this been? What's the general mood after these, these events? So let's start with the government's policy rollbacks. Um, I think the mood from our members is that the rollbacks will have a material impact on the UK's net zero transition. It will impact um, emissions reductions, the UK's ability to attract investment and also the UK's reputation. So to give you an example, um, one of the rollbacks was uh, the government scrapped minimum energy efficiency standards on the private rental sector. Um, one of our members, Lloyds Banking Group, did a survey of landlords. So they found that 57% of landlords uh, were aware of the policy change. And of those 57%, 42% have since um, uh, cancelled plans to, to make investment in, into energy efficiency measures. So the, the policy change has had a very direct impact on investment. And I think also on, on looking at sort of a macro level as well, it just sends the wrong signal to investors, to the international community, to businesses, and also the public. And I think it's unhelpful to pit uh, cost of living concerns against net zero. And what we try and do at the Aldersgate Group is to, prevent, uh, is to present that positive business case of how transitioning to low carbon technologies and solutions can support people, can help households reduce bills. Of course, and, and as you said, the next government, whatever colour it may be, will be looking to end the cost of living crisis and grow the economy. Um, and there's been concern recently that several other markets have really made a concerted effort to do that. So with the Inflation Reduction Act um, in the US and with a similar package on the horizon in the EU, um, the Chancellor's indicated that he's not going to take the same approach, that we can't outspend these markets. So what else can we do to really pair this, um, the net zero transition with levelling up, with growing the economy? Yeah. So um, at the Aldersgate Group, we've been calling for a green industrial strategy for some time now. Um, and we think it's essential to ensure that the UK remains competitive in, uh, you know, against international markets in the context of IRA and the, the EU Green Deal Industrial Plan. And by uh, industrial strategy, I don't mean going pound for dollar. The UK just can't compete and shouldn't compete in those financial terms, but there's lots that the UK can do to remain competitive. Uh, we published a report last year uh, looking at uh, decarbonising industry. Uh, we conducted some economic analysis and we found that heavy industry, so that's sort of your foundation sectors like cement, steel, ceramics, contributes 152 billion in gross value added and supports 1.4 million jobs nationally. We did some modelling, we found that if the UK doesn't support the transition, that gross value added in those jobs plummets dramatically. So we really need to, to sort of develop a strategy. And what we would like to see is government set out a really clear pathway for different sectors in industries. So for example, um, who, uh, what and by whom will, will different fuels and technologies be used? So CCUS, hydrogen, 
um, electrification. And um, I think there's been some resistance about the idea of picking winners, but we think you should pick the race and setting up those really clear pathways and, and providing that policy certainty. And I think that can help crowd in private investment into the net zero um, economy. And, and you've talked there about industries like, well, heavy industry, um, but we're also seeing some policy infighting at the moment about sectors that will require people to change their day-to-day -day lives. You've talked about how many jobs are supported in heavy industry, but something we've been seeing at the moment is about the sort of infighting on agriculture um, in the EU and the UK and the Prime Minister straight up coming out and really criticising Wales's plans um, for this. So what can we do as well to have a strategic policy vision for sectors beyond heavy industry and is it feasible to get that before the election or will we have to wait a little longer? Yeah, I mean the point you, you touched on there is skills and I think it's so important that alongside our green industrial strategy we, have a, we take a holistic view at skills. What skills will we need to transition to, to net zero? Um, one of our members, Kingfisher, have done some research and they found that there's, the UK is facing a shortfall of 250,000 tradespeople by 2030. So those are electricians, plumbers, carpenters, which is essential if we're going to install heat pumps and energy efficiency across the UK's um, housing stock. So we need to, to take a, a deep look at skills. We need to look at how we can boost awareness of different careers and pathways into green jobs. Financial support is really important too. Um, it's a big risk moving from one sector to another and we need to support people through that, whether that's through um, loans, you know, maintenance yeah. loans, grants or, or things like that. So there's lots we can do, uh, but I think you know, awareness, supporting people financially and also just looking at the broader policy landscape. So businesses won't invest in skills if there isn't demand for those goods and services. So, for example, delaying the clean heat market mechanism, which was mm. one of the recent policy rollbacks, that will have an impact on investment in skills. And you need to provide that clarity of demand um, in order for businesses to invest in skills. Mm. So we've not had an update to national skills strategy in a very long time. And, and you've mentioned finance there, and we're still waiting for some parts of the green finance strategy. And I, I would ask, to what extent can businesses and non-governmental organisations make some progress without policy, what would your advice be for people who are not looking to, to wait around? Is it possible? Yeah, of course. There's nothing stopping businesses from engaging with their supply chain and, and consumers as well. Um, uh, just to plug another one of our members, IKEA, they do loads of work in supporting their um, consumers to make greener choices, whether that's providing information in you know, catalogues on the website or in in-store displays, but helping consumers to make greener choices. Um, there, but of course, the biggest blocker is sort of regulate, regulation and mm. policy. Um, but there's lots of businesses can do in the meanwhile while we're waiting for, for those. Great. And just because we do have a prim, uh, primarily business focused um, audience, we've talked there about what businesses can do. But I think a lot of people are also looking at how can they engage with their policymakers meaningfully. And does that engagement look different in an election year, not only in the UK, but they've called it a mega election year yeah. um, across the world. So what would be your advice for a chief sustainability officer looking to make sure that they get heard by mm. their policymaker contacts? So a big challenge that businesses face in the run up to an election is not being perceived as political and they'll try and avoid that at all costs so they'll be winding down assuming the autumn election uh, the external communications but there's loads of different avenues in which you can engage with policymakers. so this year we're expecting a deluge of consultations and parliamentary inquiries you mentioned the green finance strategy earlier mm -hmm. so we're still waiting for the consultation on the uk green taxonomy and on mandatory transition plans so there's lots of consultations and select committee inquiries to engage on um, there are also lots of business government partnerships with a secretariat of one called the Net Zero Council, which is a partnership of finance, business and government, which aims to support industry to cut emissions and to develop greener practices. Uh, and there's loads of those across different sectors and industries. Um, as Jeremy Hunt hinted yesterday, we might get another fiscal event in the autumn. Um, so there will obviously be a sort of representation window in which businesses can um, submit their, you know, what they would like. And uh, you could also become a member of the Aldersgate group and uh, you know, use our channels to 
um, speak and engage with policymakers. So lots of lots of different ways. Mm. We have heard from people that it is better to do this together as well. That yeah. it's very meaningful. And you, if you engage, but if 80, 90 percent of your whole sector engages, that should make exactly. your it's more ministers. Yes. Yeah. collective voice. Fabulous. Well, we are fresh out of time for this discussion on the ED Extra stage. Thank you for bearing with me on this one. Um, and a big thank you to James for his insight and his time. Um, myself and the rest of the ED team will be back tomorrow for more conversations and discussions on the latest developments in the world of sustainability um, here on the ED Extra stage. Um, this conversation has been recorded, so do be sure to check out the website and access our new ED Extra page. Podcasts from this stage will be on um, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify and Google. But until next time, thank you and goodbye.